All right, so how to be more precise about where you can do your color control in uh, Capture One, because again, this is problematic for me. It's doing a weirdness in the, well, I'm getting some of these pinks, because I just want to isolate really just this group in the, the center part right here. That's all I really want to do. So there is a way to be more selective about your color range, and it basically involves masking areas out um, that you're telling Capture One, I don't want you to consider this area, or I do want you to consider this area. Now, the color controls are still going to be the color controls, but we can actually say we only want to apply it in this one given area. So to do that, I'm going to say let's get rid of our selection right now. So I'm simply going to click on this minus to get rid of that selection, and I'm just looking at this file. You can tell that there's something that has been done to it because I've got a little square that's happening right over here. I can see again there's something that's been, I don't know what's changed on this guy because I've thought I've gotten rid of everything. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm simply going to go up and click on the arrow, the major one at the very top, that will reset everything. And you'll see that little icon goes away telling you that this is a raw virgin copy of this uh, file. So. What we're going to deal with now is layers. So what I want you to realize is that if you take a look at all of these controls, if you look at color editor, black and white, color balance, white balance, all that kind of stuff, whatever, you see it's simply the name. There's, that's all there is is a name on here. However, if you click and open up layers and come down here, you will actually see that there's a plus down here, there's a minus down here, there's a little, uh, 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 it's supposed to be a paintbrush right here. Um, this is how we can actually do masking controls on this image. So basically what this is going to let me do is it's going to let me control to control a very specific place where I run color editor, or a very specific place where I run black and white, or a very specific place where I do color balance. So what I want everybody to do is, first off, we're going to click on this drop down arrow. And don't just click and hold it. You need to click and look at what's going on down here. There are five options that we've got here. There is empty layer, filled layer, clone layer, and new heel layer. I'm going to stay away from the clone and heel layers altogether here. We are only going to work with empty layer or filled layer. I'm going to ask you, though, to add a new filled layer. And now, nothing is going to make a lot of sense to you, but what I want you to notice that has changed is that these uh, white balance, color balance, and color editor all now have this little paintbrush next to them. And what that little paintbrush is indicating is whatever work we do is going to be saved in this adjustment layer. You can think of these sort of analogous to, uh, to, to Photoshop's uh, adjustment layers. We can name these. So I'm going to double click on that name that says layer one, and I'm going to call this, what do we call this color? Salmon? Coral. Let's call it coral. Does that sort of make sense? Yep, we'll call it coral. And so whatever work that I do on this is going to happen, I'm going to try to restrict it to this area right now. If you click open your color editor as well, you'll see that it actually looks exactly the same. None of that part has changed. However, what I want you to do is hit the M key, just the M key by itself. And you'll see that you get this red wash that goes over your entire image. That red wash is what they call the mask. Now, for me, this is unfortunate, but this is how it works. In Photoshop, when you talk about masking something out, what you talk about is actually hiding it. So if you added a layer mask to an adjustment layer, you would be hiding whatever that adjustment layer was doing to your image. It is exactly the opposite here in Capture One. The area that is covered in red is the area that's going to be impacted. Does that make sense? So you'll see what this means in just a second. Um, again, I'm going to hit the M key again to turn off my mask. And I'm going to simply do my color range selection again. So I'm going to click on the color picker. I'm going to come over and click on that uh, piece of coral that's, uh, or the coral color pastel that's in the middle. I'm going to go ahead and completely expand the saturation range by clicking on this little 
little pie wedge guy down here at the bottom. And then I don't need to be too concerned about this. I'm going to zoom in and take a look at this. My only concern is, is that it has selected all of this uh, Carl part right here in the middle. That's what I'm concerned about doing right here. However, the color range has eliminated all of these others. But the mask is saying right now, the mask is saying you can consider this entire image. I don't want to consider the entire image. So I'm going to go back up to my layers palette. I'm going to then select this drop down menu for the, it, it's the paintbrush. This is a paintbrush for a mask. I'm going to click on this drop down part right here and I'm going to say I want to erase the mask. Because what I'm going to do is, in these areas that, that the, where the color is actually selecting it, I'm fine. But what I need to do is I need to tell Photoshop that I don't want you to, so I don't want you to consider these colors that are in here. So when you do this erase tool, so this erase mask tool, you will see that this is actually how Photoshop, or how Capture One shows you a brush. Um, and so what's happening here in the brush, if you, to control the size of this brush, you can use the same keys that you use in Photoshop. So it is the bracket keys just to the right of the P key. You can use those. I'm using the open bracket that makes the brush smaller. And I'm going to use the uh, uh, other bracket, the closed bracket, to make it larger. You'll also notice that there is an area in the very middle. So it's this area right here. There's two circles. There's an area right in here and then one on the outside. That's indicating the hardness or the softness of your brush. So the circle that's in the very middle is completely hard, but as the brush starts to fade out to a softer edge, it's just giving you where both of those edges are, where it starts and where it stops. The minus in the middle is an indication that you are uh, erasing the mask. If you want better control over your brush, you hold down the uh, control key and click to get a drop down menu. And you will see that these are now the eraser settings and you can control the size of your brush. You can control the hardness of your brush. So I'm gonna bring my brush back up to about a, like a, I'm around a 185, something like that. If you click on the hardness, you can see you can actually make your brush less soft. So all the way up at 100%, that would be a completely hard brush. Or you can go all the way down to zero, which is a completely soft brush. I'm gonna leave mine somewhere in the middle, right around in the 50s. You do have opacity control in this, and you also have flow control in this. I'm gonna ask you to bring your flow all the way up to 100% and your opacity up there as well. Is this working for everyone? You also have a thing in here called Auto Mask. If we click on Auto Mask, what it'll try to do is it'll try to find edges in this. You'll see, we'll, we'll take a look at it in just a second. But anyway, so I've got my brush relatively set right now. So I'm gonna come over to this area of my image that's got these colors in here that I don't want to be a part of this. And I'm simply going to click and paint out of this part right here and let go. Uh, and that is on my Carl mask right here. I'm going to hit my M key again. That actually did remove those parts. Oh, I know what's going on. So I'm going to mask all of this part out right here so that that part is no longer in, in, in my image uh, selection part right here. I'm going to keep going down to mask all of this out. If you want to, I'm going to zoom back out just so you can see what's really going on here. If you want to hit your M key again, and you can see that these are areas that I've painted out. So I'm just going to paint out all of this area to make sure that none of that part's actually, none of that part's actually uh, going to happen in here. Uh, the rest of my image is not in my color range. So I'm going to hit the M key again to get rid of this part. Now we still see all of this. You don't need, this thing is not going to turn uh, gray uh, because we've got that part on in the color editor. Again, I'm going to actually turn off this view selected color range. But now I can actually, what's happening is I've got a restricted color range that's happening just in here with my color editor. But I've also got the mask is, is saying, you can't, you, I, I don't want that to happen to this area part over here. And so now grab your, well, it's easiest to see it with the lightness slider. If you take your lightness slider and you drop it all the way down, you'll see that it's only impacting those guys right here. It didn't change any of these other parts. It has completely restricted my range. Now, if you feel like that you didn't want this part over here to also be impacted, you can continue to work on your mask. So go back into layers, 
Make sure you are working on coral layer. Make sure that the eraser tool is picked and you can simply come down through this part in here to make sure that none of that part was actually being affected. And so you can see now this only part that is in the middle here is being impacted. Again, if you hit the M key, you can see where your mask is actually is. So again, it's saying, yep, you can hit all this area. It's also saying you can hit this area out here, but this area is not within my color range. So nothing is being impacted here. If you hold down the Option key and hit M, you can see what your mask really looks like. These are areas now that the areas that are in black are, uh, um, are not being impacted by this. The areas that are in white are being impacted by this. Is this making sense to everybody what's going on? Hit the Command M again to go back to the normal uh, menu part. Open up your color editor again. And again, I'm going to zero out my uh, um, lightness part. I just, it's, it's just the most extreme thing so you can see what's happening. We can actually take saturation and bump it up, and it will only bump it up in that area right here. That's a pretty serious saturation move. Or we can actually shift the hue in this guy as well. And you can see it's only impacting those guys that are in the very middle right here. So is this making sense to you guys now in terms of color control? Okay, I want to go back. Let's actually work with a new image right now. I'm going to actually ask you to click on the one that's called pigments. So in pigments, uh, again, it looks like it's already got a color uh, correction that's been uh, started on here. So let's just reset the color editor to completely get it to go away. So I've reset my color editor. However, I do want to do this on layers as well. So I'm going to click to open up my layers. Uh, I do have a layer one that's sitting right here. Again, that was the one that was there. It's a legacy one. So I can either click on the minus here to get rid of it, or I can actually click on the reset tool up here at the top, and it will get rid of that guy. So then I'm going to start again, and I'm going to simply, I take it back, I'm not going to start again here. I'm going to do something different here in just a second. So let's go back down to Color Editor. It's just that we've reset this image completely. And you'll notice if you look down here in the corner, you don't see any little icon down in here. So we're going to do another color range for this guy. So again, I'm under Advanced. I'm going to click on this, and I'm going to select the blues. And I'm just going to select this blue range right here. I am going to click on my View Selected Color Range, and you can see it does a really good job of selecting this part, and so this is just going to be the blues of this image. However, if you want to turn this into a layer mask, you actually can, and it's by coming up here to the color editor and in this drop down menu right here, take that back, the little three dots, you can say create a mask layer from my selection. And so when you do that, it will say it's going to create this guy right here. You'll notice that nothing has changed here right now. It sort of goes back to this, but if you open up your layers palette and you click on your layer number one right here and hit the M key again, you'll see that that is where your layer mask is. It's just put a red overlay on top of that blue. If you hold down Option and hit M, you can actually see what's going on in here. However, I've got a problem with this, and the problem that I've got with this is that there is some of this area here in the middle that is a, not a part of that selection, and I want it to be a part of that selection because this is now outside of all of that. So to do that part, again, I'm going to come over here now to Draw Mask, and then I'm going to simply make my brush a little bit smaller. Again, I can use the bracket keys to do that. And I can work directly on this mask by simply painting around the edges like this. The problem that I get here, though, is that when I get into this middle area, I can make my brush really, really, really small here. I can come into some of these areas right in here. The problem is I'm worried about painting over this edge right here. I want to somehow respect this edge right here. And right now, I can't do that. So to fix this part, come up here and hold down your, I'm hovering right over the layer itself, and again, holding down my control key to get this drop down menu, I can actually say that I want to refine this mask. 
And when you get on refined mask, you'll actually see it comes in here and it tries to analyze the image for you to see if this will be any better at all. Now it started to pick up stuff on the outside and this is actually not doing a good job here on the inside. However, you can play with this radius slider to actually see if you can get it to control your image a little bit better. So I'm continuing to drop mine down a little bit more. I'm going to continue to drop it down a little bit more. This doesn't seem like this is doing a big bang up job for me right here. So I'm going to hit cancel out of here and I'm going to then finally zoom in up to this area right in here. Again, I want to hold that down one more time. I'm going to try to refine this mask again. And I'm trying to get it to give me that brush, and it's not going to give me that brush. Um, hold down the control key and simply click in here to get to, that's what will do it. Uh, simply click to get to this guy, uh, to get your brush settings. And then let's click on auto mask. And you'll see what in auto mask happens is that you now get a third circle that goes around. And the third circle, what that's doing is, is that the center circle that's surrounding that X is telling you that that will be completely selected. You're actually getting an area that then comes out to the outside that is the feathering of that brush. And then finally, this outside area right here, what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep the edge that you're looking for inside this circle right here. So you don't want to push this guy too far out. You want it to actually be in here. So I'll show you what it looks like. So I'm simply going to come on to this edge right here and start to click and drop. And it looks now like that's actually um, over painting, but when you let go, it'll actually snap to that edge. And so you can continue to work down here like this and it will finish completing that selection for you. Hold down the control key and simply click and your brush settings will come up. Again, I'm not clicking up here on my mask. If you do it up here, I mean on the layer, you get this drop down menu here. That's not what we want. You want your brush selected. Hold down the control key and click on your brush. Did it come up? Yeah, you don't want to be clicking on any of that part in there. So simply click on one and see what happens. They look like the same, but one looks completely out of register with the other. Yeah, I don't know how to... Just, let's just start over again. So, kill both of those layers. No, come down. Click on minus, and minus again. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that selection is good. Yeah. So then, again, click on the, the little three dots right there. Come down, create mask. Okay. It Pop generates it. No, and you're fine. So then, to get this guy, hover over here, hold down the control key now click and you want to in check auto mask and then say okay and now when you start to paint on this it'll mm -hmm. find that edge and see it gets really blurry like that but then let go you went too far with that guy hit command z so then paint along that line yeah and then let go and you'll see it finds it Got it. So you got to, again, you've got to keep that edge inside this part. So zoom into your image. So inside. Mm, yeah, so you're right where you need to be. Like right there. Good. And you'll see it's spraying out over it, but now let go. Okay, and it snaps to it. Thank you. All right. That, did this work for everyone? Okay. So again, now that you've actually got a better mask in all of this, with layer one still selected, you can see, again, this is now showing me my layer. So uh, uh, option M will get rid of it. So we can now actually use all sorts of other things to control this part as well. So for instance, I could, instead of doing color editor, I could do white balance. And you'll see again, that's a possibility for this. So in white balance, I'm gonna just take the Kelvin slider and crank it all the way up and you see it doesn't change at all, and I'm gonna drag it all the way down. It's a very subtle change in here. I'm gonna try changing the tint in this guy. Yeah, I mean, it's changing things, but it's very subtle. However, if we do go back to our color editor, that is a different story altogether. So again, in our color editor, I'm gonna to select to sample this whole area, 
and I am going to then shift its hue. Uh, again, I'm gonna uncheck that show selected part right here. So take the hue and drag it all the way up and you just made that blue magenta. Are there questions about any of this? We good on this part? Okay, so layers are incredibly important. You have up to 16 possible layers. So for instance, we could do another thing here. So uh, in this case, let's say we'll go after the red instead. So I'm gonna go back down to my color editor. I am going to um, leave this part uh, on, this correction on, that part doesn't matter. I am going to do a new one here, so I'm simply selecting the color point, and I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna click on the red part right here. You can see it gets my red range. I'm gonna say, show me the, uh, view my selected color right here. Um, I'm gonna zip back out, and you can see I've got stuff in the background that it also picked up in here that I don't want to be a part of that, so again, you can go, you can choke this entire slider down. So I'm going to grab the top part right here and bring this down and you'll see it's getting rid of those parts that are in the background right there, but it's still keeping all of my red. There's still a little contamination in the background and back there. And I think that that's due to the uh, smoothness of, again, it's this area where the fall off is happening. So I'm going to grab my smoothness slider and drag it back. And you can see all of that has now been uh, pulled out of my selection and all of this now is still in in my selection, so this part is working great for me. So then again, I'm gonna come up to those little three dots, come down and say, save mask layer from selection, and it goes through it. It takes about five seconds to do it. It says it's okay, it's done. So I'm gonna go back and you'll see I've got a layer number two now. So I'm gonna uh, name my layer number two red, and I'm gonna name my layer number one blue. Uh, and both of these guys are going now. I'm gonna select red. You'll notice if I uncheck blue, it turns that adjustment off so that blue is not changed. This one has actually brought it back on. Um, the, we haven't done anything with the red though, so I'm gonna actually change the red right now. So the red layer is selected. I'm gonna open up my color editor. I'm gonna select red again. Make sure the check mark is on so that it's visible. Uh, and this is my red layer again. Um, I don't need to worry about this part changing up here. The, I don't need to about worry about choking up this mask again because the layer is actually being masked out. Again, if I take a, if I hit the M key, that's what is on the only the only thing that's being affected is this guy right here. So um, I'll be fine to go in this. So in my color editor, again, I'm going to shift the hue in this and I'll take it in a completely different direction or up in this direction right here but that is actually being impacted by that entire guy because that's still a part of this layer. Oh, sorry, let me turn off this. and now it's actually working. So you can see the only thing that it's impacting is the red, the only thing this is impacting is the blue, and you can keep going on. Like I said, you have up to 16 uh, possible layers here to actually do that part. Does this make sense to everyone as well? Okay, I wanna go back really quickly to, um, 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 um. Let's go back to the pastels one last time. I just want to show you one other thing that actually is going on in here. So in the pastel thing, I'm going to get rid of the layer, the current layer that we've actually already got on here. Let me see. Let me make sure this is the one I really want to do this on. I take that back. Let's do this on this one right here. No. Let's do the pastel one. Uh, okay, and the pastel ones. Um, so we are going to do the same thing again. I'm gonna actually develop a, um, uh, um, uh, oh, I know what we can do. We'll change this in a different way. Um, I'm gonna just uh, add my own blank layer mask again. I'm gonna throw the Carl away. You don't have to, you do, I, I just 
trying to keep the housekeeping here a little bit more simple. Uh, I am going to click on this uh, drop down menu and you see if you just click on it, you get a layer. The problem is I don't know if this layer is filled or not. If you hit the M key, you don't get anything, which is an indication to me that it is an empty layer. That's not what I want. So I'm actually going to undo that part, click on the drop down menu to create a filled layer. So again, that's just telling me that there's a mask over the entire thing. So again, if you hit the M key, you'll see that this is completely covered in red. However, there's a thing here called Luma Range. If you click on Luma Range, it actually brings up a dialog box that lets you refine this mask based on luminosity. And so you can see what happens if you come up to the top right here and click on this point and start to drag it in this direction, these lighter pieces of chalk are actually being removed from the mask based on the luminosity. These are really light pieces right here. If I go in the other range over here, these are dark pieces down here at the bottom. So it's only going to be the areas of deep shadow that are in here. The other thing about this range you should know is that there is the space that is now between these two slider uh, points is completely selected. However, there's a fall off that actually happens out here. So you can see everything. This is actually set at a 191. Everything between 64 and 191 is still being, it's, it's a part of my active mask. It will be impacted. But everything that is outside of this 211 up is 100% out of the mask and then there's a gradual step this is just a gradation between these two going from completely out of the mask to completely in the mask you can also control these points these things actually change as well so you can use these to really 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 refine your mask then there's a radius and a sensitivity slider over here and these things I got to be honest with you they don't really explain how these things work what they really ultimately do um, because again this is either going to be in your range or out of your range. This is sort of like voodoo for uh, uh, phase right now. I wouldn't be surprised if these ultimately disappear. Um, you can also invert your range by clicking on this and it'll do just the opposite. Now anything that's in the middle here has not been masked and anything that's on the outside is being impacted. I'm going to go back to where we were before. And then again, you could go ahead and say OK to this to apply that mask. If you hit Command M, you'll see this is the mask that it just built. Again, you can go in with a brush and you can continue to work on this mask to refine it. But is this all making sense to you guys, what's going on here? So it's just a way to, again, generate a mask, refine a mask uh, based on luminosity. Are we good on this part? OK, are there any questions about color and what we're doing. I do want to show you one last thing here really quickly. So if you've done all this, um, you can leave it there. It doesn't matter. I'm going to go back up to this image right here. Do you guys have two of these images? Yep. OK. So the bottom one you can tell has also had something done to it. This is a variant. Again, you see this one in the two. This is a variant, this one down on the bottom. I want to restore this. Oh, I know what it is. It's the color balance on here. So I'm not going to restore that guy. I'm simply going to leave him where he is. Um, but split toning in Capture One is so much easier than it is in anything else. You can't believe it. So to see it, it's uh, color balance here. So it's not color editor, but it is color balance. I want you to actually open this guy up. And what you'll see that happens in color balance, and again, for you guys who have a big screen, I'm going to show you a good trick here. For me, on a smaller screen, this gets to be harder to do. But what you'll see here is, is that when you open up color balance, what it does is the first screen that opens up that says three-way in here, it's got a control to control the color balance of my shadows. It's got a control to do the uh, color balance of my midtones, and it's also got one to do my highlights. However, these things are extremely small, I think, and hard to get to and hard to read. So instead, you can do much larger independent controls. So to do that, if you click on shadow, for instance, this gives me a way to actually do much, much, much easier control. I've got a bigger thing to actually work with. Then I can go to midtones. I've got the same big one, and I've got highlights, which is also the same big one. However, if you've got enough screen real estate, you can have multiple copies of the same tool. So to see what that means, I want you to come down here to the bottom area that's right underneath this, hold down your control key, click, and the tool that you want to add is color balance. 
now we've got two copies of color balance. I've got one that's sitting up here and one that's sitting right down here. You can do this again. I'm going to collapse color balance, come right underneath it, and I'm going to click and I'm actually going to add another tool and I'm going to add a third version of color balance. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tear this last one off and bring it up over here. I'm going to open up this one right here. So now I've got my first color balance that's sitting up here that it's actually set to highlights. In my second one that's down here, I'm going to have it set to midtones. And in my third one over here, I'm going to have it set to shadows. So now I've got a really big display that will allow me to control the shadows, the highlights, and the midtones. So to see what color balance does, it's strictly a remapping. You've got your color right here in the middle that is completely neutral. And depending on where you push this, it will push things in one color direction or another. So I'm going to start with my shadow uh, control, my shadow balance here, and simply click here in the middle, and I'm going to drag this all the way down. And what I've just said is I want to take all the shadows of this image, and I want to pump blue into them. And you can see that the areas of her hair have taken on sort of a blue cast in here. Again, if you want to see a preview of what's going on and not going on, hold down your uh, Option key and click on that little reverse arrow and you can temporarily turn this on and off and you can see I've just introduced into my shadows a great deal of blue. Then I'm going to come over to my midtones and I'm going to go in the complete opposite direction. I'm going to drag that midpoint up to pump in yellows into my midtones. That's actually again popped in a lot of yellow into my midtones. Again to see what the impact that that's having hold down your option key and click to get rid of that part and you'll actually see that that's what's happening. You'll notice that it's getting rid of the correction of both of these tools. And then finally, I'm going to go to my highlights and I'm going to do that same move. I'm going to really pump that up into uh, the midtone areas that are up into here. Now, personally, I think that these are a little too saturated, the yellows that we actually put in here. So that's what controls these things on the side. If you actually grab this slider and start to pull it back down, you will see that it starts to bring this thing back closer down to the center point. Again, this center point is no saturation down here. That's what's happening in this point here. So it'll allow you to actually fine tune these things without, once you get the color and you don't want to change the color, this lets you move it without having to move that little circle point here. So this is now actually dropped down the saturation of that yellow just a little bit. You've also got a lightness control that's in this as well. So if you come over here, that's what this arc right here is. So again, these are my highlights. If I want to open my highlights up to make them brighter, I can simply drag and kick this guy up. So this is now a perfectly a good example of how you would split tone this image to give you much warmer highlights and midtones and much cooler shadows. Does this make sense to everyone what's going on here? Are we good on this part? Try and do this in Photoshop this quickly. Can't be done. Doesn't look anywhere near this good anyway. Any more questions about this? Are we feeling okay about color, Maddie? Absolutely. Yep. The only advantage, disadvantage to this, and I'll just tell you this right now, so far, and we haven't gotten it into this class because this isn't really a Photoshop class, but if you've been in my retouching class, you know in that class that I'm a big believer in bringing raw data into Camera Raw and using it as a smart object in Photoshop so that you can redevelop it over and over and over again. If you find that you like color correction in Capture One better, which personally I do, I think the skin tones are so much better in Capture One than they are in uh, Camera Raw, it's ridiculous. Um, actually, I'll show you an example of that in just one second. Um, at any rate, um, uh, so, so for me, what I do is I actually do the color correction here, I process out a copy of that file and bring that into Photoshop and then start dealing with it from that point on. If I need multiple processings, like the way I do smart objects to do dodging and burning, do the dodging and burning here as well. So you make a version of the file that's darker, a version that's normal, a version that's lighter, bring all three of those into Photoshop, stack them up as layers, and use layer masks to control what's, uh, what's dodged and what's burned in Photoshop. In Photoshop. Yeah. Because the truth of it is, once you get into that multiple masking, the masking controls that are here in, camera, in Capture One are, are rudimentary at best compared to Photoshop. Uh, okay, is this making sense, everyone, what's going on? All right, so, so to see really quickly, 
um, what this is all this part is all about again you can simply click on this to remove this tool on the little three dots remove that one and I'm gonna remove this one it doesn't undo all the work that you've done you'll see in all the work that you've done if you look at your midtones and your shadows on the one single one that's left they're all still in effect as a matter of fact you could get rid of this last one as well and it won't get rid of your corrections your corrections are all still going to happen there now it's just you'd have to come you have to to to, to add the tool again to go in to get rid of this correction part does this make sense everybody okay a um, couple of things we're going to try here really quickly guys and then we're going to get out of color uh, really fast so this image right here I need to make sure that this image right here is color balanced you'll notice that there's a bunch of um, of little uh, there's something that's in here so I need to restore this image to its original um, uh, uh, un corrected unimpacted uh, phase at all so again I'm simply going to come up here and I'm going to click on that to bring it all the way back so this now this is is again Photoshop doesn't know I mean capture one doesn't know what this really should be however this is from this very same shooting right here so this image has been color balanced again I'm simply going to hold down the shift key and select the second menu so they're both selected but again, because this one has already been color balanced and it is the active one, it's the primary one, that's what this little uh, line around here means, uh, simply come up to the double headed arrow and click on that. And it will bring up an adjustment, capture one thing, and it'll say, okay, these are the things that we think have been changed. The white balance has been changed on this, but it also looks like there has been a color basic editor changed on this and an advanced both. If you don't want to apply these to this image right here, you simply uncheck them and simply continue to scroll down here to see if anything else has been checked. Nothing else has been checked. So now when I say apply to this, the only thing that's going to be applied to this guy is going to be color balance, is the white balance of this. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. This has now been white balanced. I'm going to then click to, again, I only want to see this guy alone, but you have to deselect both first. So I'm going to deselect both by clicking next to the thumbnail. Then I'm going to click on this guy again. And then I have no idea if the Photoshop version of your all, if Photoshop is working on your computer. But if it is, simply drag this thumbnail onto Photoshop. And it should launch into Photoshop. It should bring this in into Camera Raw. And you'll see in this case, again, I don't have anything in here. I, it didn't bring in the white balance with me. So I'm going to cancel out of here because I need the white balance to come in with me as well. So back into Capture One. I'm going to select both of these images and bring them into Camera Raw. I mean, into, on top of Photoshop, which will bring them into Camera Raw. Because this way I can do the color balance again. So I'm simply going to zoom in on this guy again. And we'll do our color balance. And say OK to that. Do a select all from the menu that's up here. And then a sync all to apply the white balance to this image. And then I'm only going to open this image in Photoshop. So, and I can open it, you can open it as a smart object, it doesn't really matter. I'm just trying to get you to see uh, all, the only thing we've done in both versions of this is um, um, uh, uh, white balance. So this is the version of it in Photoshop, but I want to show you what this looks like, the difference. I'm going to go into Capture One. Again, I want to see this just by itself. Sure. So what I'm trying to do is I want to show you the difference in processing a file in Camera Raw and processing a file in Capture One. Okay, so in Capture One, the only thing that we have done to this file is white balanced it. I want to do the same thing in Capture in Camera Raw, so I need this I need the file that's got the card in it there as well. So again, I'm simply, I've uh, selected the one that has the card, hold down either the command or the shift key, it doesn't matter, and select the second one. So now they're both selected. And then simply drag those thumbnails onto the icon for Photoshop in your dock. And they will both come in.
Do what? It did all of this. This is what you want. Okay. All right, so color balance this guy first. Right. Zoom into this. Yep, and hit white balance tool. Click on that patch. Okay. Wrong one, Wrong the white one. balance tool. Perfect, okay. and it, wait, select all, come up here. Nope, so, drop down menu, select all. Drop down menu again. Sync settings, hit okay. That now has color balanced this guy. Okay. This is the only one we want to open, so just click on him mm -hmm. and then hit open. All right. And you're good to go. Did that work for you, Liz? Yep, thank you. Okay. So now what we need to do is. It doesn't matter. So now I've got a copy of this image. I'm going to drag my Photoshop to the side so that I can see this next to the image in Capture One. Actually, I'm going to make this image bigger. Hang on one sec. And I'm going to go back into Capture One and make it the only image. And then go back into Photoshop so I can see them side by side. Which of those colors would you rather have? Look at how fucking red. This has always been the case of Camera Raw. It pumps so much red into the skin tones. She looks like me. Right? Wouldn't you much rather work with this? Look at how beautiful the skin tone is, and look how this just is a raw day. Does that make sense, everyone? So that's why most of the people that I know who do fashion and beauty work do all of their color work here in Capture One. OK, um, if that's the case, you can close that up. You don't need to save it. That was the Photoshop version of it. I'm going to go back into Capture One. We're getting through it, guys. OK, I'm going to show you one of the last things in Capture One here that is kind of critical to us. And it's the last thing in the color part. And then we're going to get into developing files and call it a day. Um, but you'll have gotten all the way through a lot of this part. So for me, I'm going to start with, if you go all the way down to the bottom, there is that Terry Richardson sunburned image that's in here. Um, now, if you guys have been with me in my retouching class, we actually use this, how to get rid of the sunburn. And in Capture One, the last thing that I want to show you about how to get rid of the sunburn is, is that this becomes the, um, this is the one tool that I haven't seen anywhere else. It doesn't exist anywhere else. I'm shocked that Photoshop has not ripped this tool off, but they haven't. So at any rate, we are going to use it, and I'll show you how it actually is used. So we're going to start with a color editor. Um, but I'm also going to do this on a new layer. Again, you'll notice, because I don't have any layers going on here, I don't have that little uh, paintbrush that's right next to color editor. I want that little paintbrush that's next to color editor. So I'm going to come over here to do a new layer. So I'm clicking on layers, and then I'm going to click on add. Again, in this drop down menu, I want to add a filled layer. And in this filled layer, I'm going to call it Remove Sunburn. Sorry, I had a white screen. So if you hit the M key, you'll, go, you'll see that you've got your mask over the whole thing. M key, again, just hides it. But we've got a mask on the whole thing. So is everybody good with this image? OK, color editor, open up. You'll notice that that little paintbrush is next to this thing right now. And so now what we're going to do is go to the next one over, skin tone. So in skin tone, what happens is this. This is a completely different control. You'll see here that you've still got, it looks to, the, in the beginning, it looks pretty much the same. You've still got the color sampler tool, the color picker tool. You still have a smoothness slider. You've still got a hue, saturation, lightness part. But now you've got something called uniformity. And this is the thing that Photoshop has never been able to steal or replicate. So the way this tool works is that what, I'm, what my challenge is in here is that <clears throat> I've got normal skin tone that I can see right here, 
and I've got sunburn skin. And so what the uniformity slider will do is it'll actually move areas to the point that I pick. So to show you what that means, to use this tool again, make sure you're under skin tone, click your color picker. You need to click on the perfect skin tone. You don't click on the bad area. You click on the area that you want everything to be. So for me, I'm gonna probably come somewhere down here on her lower stomach because I, I worry that there's, um, who knows, she could have farmer tan. You can see that she's got sunburn up in her uh, shoulders up in here. Um, this top part of her chest here has also got sunburn in it. This arm over here could have sunburn. The real safe place that I know is right down here underneath on her stomach seems like uh, okay to me so I'm gonna click on that and you will actually see it does the exact same thing that we have been talking about before um, uh, I, I, it gives you a point that's sitting right here and it also gives you a range that you can actually work with right here I'm going to leave this range exactly where it is right now and see what happens to this image first so then again, if you take a look at hue, we're gonna click uh, our, here, I, this is what we can do. V click on view selected color range, and you'll see that pretty much everything in this image is in my range right here. You can't see that the bra is out of this range right here because again, it's a black and white image on a black and white image. Um, there's no, re so basically this whole image is skin tone is what's really going on. So at any rate, that's not gonna help us at all. However, if we do click the lightness slider and drop it all the way down, this is where you can actually see sort of extreme changes in this. However, what you'll notice is that the changes here are extremely light uh, compared to what this would be in the advanced version. Um, again, to see, I'll show you the advanced version in just a second. The, one of the things that you need to know about skin tone is that these controls now are extremely subtle. You'll notice that here, if we click on saturation and drag it all the way forward, we get a saturation of 30. The saturation in the advanced panel goes up to 200. So these are very, very, very small increments now that are happening here in this skin tone part down here. You'll also notice that you don't get multiple uh, uh, options here. You can't do the trick that I showed you earlier where you pick that color, you drove its hue all the way to one side, and then you picked it again and drove the hue again. We don't have those, those, those multiple uh, control points on here. So at any rate, just to say all these things are extremely um, uh, subtle. So anyway, I'm gonna zero this back out because the thing I really wanna show you though is this uniformity. So right now, the problem that I have on this is that in part, it's color. So in this uniformity slider, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the hue all the way to the right-hand side. And you'll see that it sucks a lot of that red out. So what's happening here is this. Look up at my screen here really quick. What I am saying now is I'm saying, okay, I've got this whole range of color right here that's established by this little pie. When I drug that slider all the way to the right-hand side, what I said was I said, I want every single color in here moved towards that little dot. That little dot was the target point on this girl's stomach that I had picked from the very beginning. Does that make sense what's going on? So what we're saying here, I'll show you up on my screen, what we're saying here is that areas like right in here that were the deepest of the most sunburned reds, we are taking that and we are changing that back down to here to this more desaturated, less, less red intense color. And that's why that red just got sucked out. Now I've still got other problems that are existing here and that's the other two sliders. It's this area that's underneath, uh, that's up here where it is also too dark. So if you click on the lightness slider and crank it all the way over, you'll see it's impacting all of my image right now. That's okay, we'll deal with that in just a second. And then finally, you've got this saturation slider here as well, and you can pull that all the way over as well. So now what I have said is, I want everything that was picked in this image to be the exact same color, saturation, and lightness of this one point. And you can see, it does a really good job of getting rid of that part. So I, I, this part doesn't, it, so it's not impacted here anymore. So uh, again, however, this has actually done damage to like, look what it did to her hair and look what it has done to the rest of her arms over here. So, and I think that this is probably too strong of a correction. However, I need to refine my mask in the layer to really get a judgment of what's going on here. So to do that, go back to your layer part, 
Make sure that you are working on the mask. Those so remove sunburn part right here. And we are going to, again, click on this drop down menu and we are going to erase parts of the mask. And again, if you want to really see what's going on, you can hit the M key and that will show you your slider. And then as we are going to click erase right here, I'm going to pull all of this off. Uh, again, I've still got right now, uh, let me check to see if I've got this going on here as well. So I'm simply going to hold down my control key and click and get my drop down menu. So I do have auto mask is actually on. So it'll try to get close to, um, uh, close to these areas right here. So I'm simply going to remove this part because I don't need it to impact this. And I'm going to do this part over here. And I'm going to do the area of her boobs that, are, that is white. And if you want to see this in real time without that mask on it, just hit the M key again. It'll still work. And you can see it's bringing all of that color back. And then you can also see you can drag it across the top to bring back all the color in this girl's hair. So this is where I'm at right now. However, we can still work on the color editor. So if I open up the color editor again, all these things are still there. So if I feel like that the hue in here was wrong, if I feel like that was too aggressive, I can actually change that part. But the truth is, is that I feel like it actually looks pretty good. I'm gonna open up my layers palette again and uncheck the remove sunburn part. And you can see that this is just impacting the sunburn that's right on her chest. So that's one way of doing it. Does that sort of make sense? Another way to do it is this. Make sure you're working on this layer, sunburn layer right here. Hit the M key to show your mask. And what I want to do is I want to completely get rid of this mask. So I'm going to make my brush much larger and I'm simply going to paint the whole thing away. I'm going to get rid of it. It brings all the sunburn back. It brings everything back. Because I don't personally think that this is the best way to actually do retouching. I think for me, the way I like to do retouching is to actually paint the correction in. So you can see right now, if you hit the M key back and forth, you have no mask on here. There's a little bit right there. Um, there. There is no mask on here, but it's still on there. I'm gonna change this now. Instead of doing a race mask, I'm gonna change my brush to draw mask. Then I'm gonna click again, control click on this, and I'm going to take the flow of this brush way down. Now, for those of you who have been in my retouching class, you know the difference in flow and opacity. Um, what opacity does, it will lay down a certain amount of density in here. I want the full density of it, but I want to build this up slowly. So I brought my flow down three, uh, uh, in that sort of that two, three area range right here. That's how I'm gonna bring mine down. If we had a Wacom tablet right now, you would click on this to use pin pressure. That would also control your flow. But now what you can do is, and again, uh, you'll see it happen slowly uh, here. Let's just come over here to the side. Let's just see what it looks like over here on the side really quick. Because I, I don't want to, I'm painting a red mask on red skin and it's going to be hard to see. But if you start to come over here and you start to slowly go back and forth, you see you start to build the density of the mask back in. I'm going to undo that and I'm going to actually do it on her chest right here, but I don't want to see the mask. So I'm going to hit the M key just to see this happen. And then you can slowly paint this in so that you can actually control it and a little bit up on her chest up into here. Now, if I see what my mask looks like, this is what it looks like. If you hit uh, option M, you can see that the areas that were the most sunburned, I'm actually hitting them harder. The areas that are less sunburned, I'm hitting them less. This is all caused by being able to control the flow of how I'm painting this part in. So again, option delete to bring this part back and you can continue to work on this part of it here to actually bring these things back in. Is this making sense to everyone? Are we good on this part? Did that work for you? All right. Really quickly, we talked about cropping. So do me a favor, go back up to, let's go back up to the girl Let's go back to the girl that we did the split toning on. 
Uh, so this version right here, I want to return this. I want to get rid of all the control. Well, actually, we'll leave the control on there. Who cares? We'll leave the, the split toning that's on there. However, I do, want to I do want to crop this image. So in cropping this image, if you come up to the crop tool that's sitting right up here at the very top and you click on it, you should get, click and hold it down, you should get a drop down menu. There are a series of predetermined crops that are in here. So for instance, this two by three is actually the size of a 35 millimeter, uh, which this is not. Um, but again, there's various different crops. So for instance, if you click on the square crop and then simply come over to your image and click and drag out, you will get a square crop. To control how your cropping is actually viewed is a preference. So come up to preferences really quick. Come down to preferences. In the preference menu, click on the crop tool right here. And this crop tool allows you to control how different things work here. So for me, I always want the crop tool to show. I want the grid part to show whenever I do that. Some people though don't ever want to see that part. Some people only want to see it when you're actually dragging it out. I actually keep it on always. In terms of the opacity, I personally like my croppings to be, uh, to, for it to end up being black like this. A lot of people don't like that, so you can actually change this. You can drop its opacity back to say like 50%, and this will show you, it'll give you, it'll show you what you can see behind and in front. If you take the brightness slider and bring it up, this will actually also show you a different version of it. So if you drag the brightness slider all the way up and bring the opacity all the way up, the girl is surrounded by white instead of black. So these are just controls that you can use to determine how you like to see your crop. Again, for me, I prefer to have it uh, show black and then I also prefer it to be black around that. Then in this last part down here in, in, in terms of showing the frame, again, I want this frame around here, I want to see the crop. This would actually change that. And then you'll also notice when we were doing this that they, uh, there were actually labels that were being kicked out. Um, those labels are showing you the size of your crop. You can have those only during drag. You can have those always on. If you click them on, you'll see mine. They just showed up again. They're always on there. Some people don't ever want to see those uh, uh, measurement markers. So that would actually be uh, never. So I like mine during the drag to actually see that. So this has now been set up for the way I like it. And this image has now been crop square. If you want to get rid of the crop, and this gets to be tricky, you need to go outside of the crop and you need to simply click once. And that will return you to your, to your entire image. The last thing I want to show you about crop though is how you generate a custom crop. To do that, again, click on the drop down tool here and we are going to add an aspect ratio. And the aspect ratio that I'm going to add is one for a US magazine. So I'm going to simply type in US magazine. And then we're going to do the ratio. The problem with ratios in Capture One is they do not accept decimal points. So the true ratio of a US magazine is eight and a quarter by 10 and 5 eighths. You can't put that in in this. If you try to do it, if you do the eight and a quarter, so try it, type in 8.25 and then simply hit the tab key to go over to do the height of it and you'll notice that it, it truncated the eight and it now it's not 8.25 anymore, it's just eight. So to get this to actually work, you need to put in 825 by 1087. That is again those exact same measurements just without the decimal points in it. And then click OK to that. And now when you actually you'll see in your drop down menu right here, you'll see down here there's a list of them at the bottom. There's a check mark next to US Magazine which means that's going to be the cropping here. And you simply click and drag out your cropping and this is the size of a US Magazine page. Once you get down like this, you can actually still come over to the corners and treat it a little bit more like this. So for me, this would be how I would crop this for a U.S. magazine because I don't like knees and I'm not really into amputating arms and hands either. Make sense? Are we good on this part? Again, to get rid of the crop altogether, you simply click outside of it and that will actually get rid of the crop as well. Yeah. You need to press and hold it. Um, 
Okay, there's a weird little thing that happens in shooting that I didn't show you guys before, but we might as well talk about Maybe we did talk about this before, but it's this guy right here. So when you guys are actually doing your lighting, you set up and you're shooting tethered, do you keep all the frames that you shoot? So you start out, the first frame you shoot, it's like horrible. It's like five stops overexposed, and then you start making adjustments to your lighting. But, you know, and it takes a while to actually get, so you go through 10, 20, 30 frames, whatever. How many guys, how many frames did you guys shoot when you were doing, when you and uh, 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 Liz were doing the, um, your lighting uh, swipe game last week? You have any idea? A lot. Yeah, you guys were up uh, close to 200, something like that, right? Do you keep all those frames? No. So, what I'm going to show you, I just want you to be aware of this. There's a lot of people that, that, personally, I think you should keep them all until you get your final lighting. Because there's times where you think, oh my God, I need to go back and look at where we were before, you know, to make references to where you were before. It's just information that you can have. And then once you get your lighting down, you can throw all the other ones away. Not a problem. There's people who do not like to shoot like that. There's people who only want to, uh, they, they just want to get their lighting done. They don't want any frames of that. So it's this thing up here. If you come up, it's um, this little circle up here that's got an X in it. If you click on that, you'll see it puts a whole series of circles with those X's on your image right now. This is called composition mode. And what happens in composition mode is, is that every time you do a capture, it overwrites your other capture. So you only end up, as long as this is on, you only end up with your, la your latest frame. Does that make sense, everyone? So this can be dangerous to use because if you do this and you think you're shooting, at the end of your shoot, no matter what happens, you will have only your last frame. But again, people use this because they don't then, if they're doing lighting and they go through 50 frames of lighting, they don't have to, they don't have any of their, the, the, frame one through 49, they don't have. They only gotten frame number 50 and it's theirs and they keep it and that's just it. The reason they put these big marks on here is to warn you that that could be a problem, right? So I'm just pointing this out so that if you see these things, you know what they are and you realize that that's going to be a problem. So simply click on that and they go away. And now every frame that you shoot will continue to go on and on and on and on and on. Are we good on this part? Okay processing. So this is the last thing that we're really going to get to right here, and it's this. It's the little gear that looks like this. So if you click on this little gear that looks like this, we need to go through the processing part of this pretty extensively um, because there is an enormous amount of um, power in the processing part that, right happen, that happens right in here. Now, in my case right here, I've got a whole series of processing recipes. On the computers that you guys are on, you probably have very few. Can you tell me what you do have? <laughs> so you've got uh, A3, oh my god, you've got an A3 300 PPI print ready. Uh, JPEG sRGB, is this what you, all you guys have? Yeah, yeah uh, JPEG sRGB quick proof, uh, JPEG sRGB, wow, they're really into uh, sRGB, aren't they? And then finally, you've got a TIFF Adobe RGB 8-bit. Uh, okay, so we are going to build a new recipe just to go through the whole process of how it actually happens here, uh, and then we'll talk about the advantages of certain things that you guys have. Um, okay. I'm going to go back to a normal image right now. So I'm going to go back to the girl that was actually uh, in the, um, uh, the more headshot of the girl. Um, this is the one I actually want to do it on because I don't want weird color happening in the other. There's one other thing that you need to know about the way Photoshop is actually, I'm not Photoshop, about Capture One, the way it's actually set up that can be highly problematic. It's something you guys need to be aware of. And what you need to be aware of is that right now, whatever uh, process that I have actually got selected, so here in my process part, is having an impact on what I see on screen right here. So the proofing profile for what you see is being determined by what's on screen right here. And to show you what I mean by that, you guys don't have one of these yet, but you will in a second. I've actually got a process recipe here. Again, these are saying, this is how I want to process out this file, because this is these files are still raw right here. This is a raw file, but I'm just saying, if I wanted to process it out to make a TIFF out or whatever. I've got a version of this that's actually a CMY that will actually process this out into CMYK color space. Watch what happens to this image when I click on it. 
the proofing that I'm getting on my screen right now is what this file would look like as a CMYK printed out file. So this is soft proofing. Does this make sense to you guys? So again, if I go back to my Adobe RGB, which is what most screens are, this looks more normal. But the reason this now is looking washed out is because this is as good as a printer would actually be able to print this file. Printers don't print anywhere near, don't have anywhere near the saturation or the contrast that you have in on screen. Does that make sense, everyone? So it's just to be aware of the fact that, that when you change these printing uh, uh, processing uh, 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 recipes, that this has an impact on what you see on screen. To see where that is controlled, come up here to your view menu. They've moved it. It's in a different place. And you can see right down here that your proof profile right down here. So again, up to the view menu, down to proof profile. It is controlled by selected recipe. If you wanted to always override that and actually only see it in Adobe RGB, you could pick this. However, most people would argue that you shouldn't be doing that, that you in all honesty should be looking at whatever your destination is going to be. You should have some idea of what it's gonna look like. Does this make sense to everyone? So if all of a sudden somebody says, oh, I would love to see what this looks like on a CMYK printer, you can show it to them. Are we good on this part? Uh, okay, so we're gonna build a new recipe right now. To do that, start up here at the process recipes, come down to the thing at the very bottom and you wanna click on the plus and you wanna simply say new recipe. And it'll open up a little place right in here and you can have thousands of these. Um, so, and we're gonna name this one and I'm gonna call this TIFF, T-I-F-F, um, Adobe RGB. I take it back, let's do this pro, does anybody in here use Profoto? All right, then let's just stick with Adobe RGB. However, I am gonna do this as a 16-bit file, Adobe, huh, A-D, A-D, O-B-E. God, that looks so wrong. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna do 16-bit. Are we good on this part? Okay, so then we need to actually build that recipe. So go ahead and click on this to select, to highlight the whole thing. Do not uncheck this right now, but to highlight the whole thing. Down here in process recipes is where you control exactly what we've said we want this to be. So in the basic tab, you wanna select that first. In your drop down menu for format, you wanna pick TIFF. But you'll see, you could actually do PSD files here, you can do DNG files, you can do JPEGs, you can do PNGs. In this case, we're gonna do a TIFF. In the next window over, in terms of the drop down menu, bit depth, we are going to change this to 16 bit, because that's what we said we wanted to do. Now, TIFF actually allows for compression. In our case, we're not going to compress these files, we're gonna leave it as uncompressed. In the drop-down menu for ICC profile, you will see that you've got, in my case, only two options right here. And that will be the case until you say, show me all. And if you do show me all, and then click on this drop-down menu, you will see that I have thousands of options that I can actually build this. So I can do print profiles that are destined for uh, Japanese CMYK presses for US uh, CMYK presses for uh, there's an sRGB here that would allow me to go to do stuff that was destined for websites so but again in my case right here I'm gonna go ahead and leave it at Adobe RGB because that's how I want to output this file and it's what I said here in my list right here then in terms of the resolution this doesn't really matter because again I'm not resizing this file it's just so this is just the resolution that it comes in it's just it's it's, it's meaningless, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, the scale of this, I'm going to leave it fixed. You can do different things here to get different sizes. So for some of you guys I know, uh, for instance, if you were doing um, uh, um, a lot of work to prep files for your website. So do you have specific sizes for your website that you use, that you upload your files to? So for instance, my fi the, the files for my wife, the upload, the height of the upload for her um, is 1,200 pixels. So you could come here and just say the long edge of this, I want to set, and in your drop down menu right here, you could say pixels, and you could put in 1,200 pixels right here. So there's a huge amount of flexibility that you've got in these guys. However, in my case, <clears throat> 
I'm just going to leave it at fixed. What fixed means is that it's just going to be whatever this image is. So then the scaling down here, it's at 100%. If you wanted this image to be half its size, you would put in 50%. A quarter of its size it would be 25%. And then finally, this part down here, open width. Now, some people use this a lot, but this is, there's a danger in using this. You can pick, what you can say in here is, is that as soon as you have finished developing this file, open it up in Photoshop for me. So, uh, or in another program for me. And you can pick what you want it to open up in. And it's a good way to check to make sure that the process happened well and that something didn't go horribly wrong. So it can be a good check for you to actually see that. And it just saves you having to go find the file and open it up again. However, the downside to this is that, let's say you decide you are going to process 1,000 files overnight which you can do, then every single one of those files is going to try to open up in Photoshop. And sooner or later, you are going to choke your computer and all your processing will stop. You won't be able to do anything. You won't be able to close the print. You'll lose all of your work. You won't lose your raw files, <clears throat> but all the processing work that you tried to get done will actually will not work. Does that make sense? So I pr uh, leave this actually at none right here. So that gets us through the basic part right here. The next one over, click is file. I'm just going on the tabs across here. In terms of the output location, if you want to make sure that this is being output to the correct place, simply click on this arrow and it will take you out to the output folder. Now remember, we can change output folders in the library. We could designate a different output folder. So to see what that looks like, I'm going to go back to my library and I'm going to pick uh, for my output folder, I'm going to go to my system folders here, my navigation right here. I'm going to open up my uh, boot folder right here. I'm going to open up my user folder. It's my home folder right here. In my home folder, I'm going to open that up and I'm going to go to my trash, my toss folder right here. I'm going to hold down the control key, click on this, and say, I want to set my toss folder as my output folder here. And it's going to say, would you like to remember the other one before? I'm going to say no. You'll see there's a little gear around here right now. And then when I go back again to my process folder part right here, if I then click on show me output location now, it takes me to my toss folder. So again, it's a good habit to get into clicking on this just to check to make sure you want this to go to the place you want it to go to. However, yeah, we'll just go ahead and leave it that way. Um, the next thing down, subname and subfolder. I'm going to add a subfolder to this. And you want to click on this. You want to get in the habit of doing this, trust me. And I'm going to put in TIFF RGB 16 bit. So simply type that in, T-I-F-F Adobe RGB 16 bit. Next one over, adjustments. In this case, it's just telling you you only have two options here. If you want to, if you've been doing a lot of cropping when you've been looking at your imagery, which is fine, if you've been looking at a lot of that stuff, let me go back to my capture folder. Uh, if you've been doing a lot of cropping in your imagery and you want to have those crops applied when you actually process it, your file, you would leave this as respect the crop. If for some reason, though, you were just looking at crops because you were just wanted to see how the image looked when it was cropped, but you really want to process out the full file, you don't want a crop version of it, you can simply say ignore the crop on this and then none of the crops will be applied. You will get your full image. Most people would suggest you do that. Cropping should be one of the last things you do and this would be one of the first things that you do. And then output sharpening here, you would definitely, in my opinion, put this for no output sharpening. You don't know what you're going to do with this file. So the idea that you would do sharpening for it, you don't know if this is going to be a screen print, a printed print, you don't know if this is going to be inkjet, CMYK, you don't know if it's going to be a billboard size, if it's going to be a postage stamp size, you don't have any of those things made yet. And you would have to know all of those decisions before you could pick your output sharpening. So this is where I'm going to leave this part. The next part over for metadata. This actually simply will put in whatever it is you want actually put into this file. So if you want it to include the rating and color tag, that's fine, but only Capture One can read that color and rating tag. Copyright information, you would want that to be in here. How many people have you put your GPS coordinates into your files? 
You want to know how the person who's going to rape and kill you finds you? Because all the pictures that you took in your house have your GPS coordinates. Your phone is your worst culprit in this. All that shit, all those pictures that you're putting up on Instagram, if you've got GSP tracking, it's all embedded that information in your metadata and I can find your house, I can find your apartment. I'm not the guy who's gonna rape and kill you, but somebody, guys, I'm just telling you, don't put that shit in there. Uncheck this. Camera metadata, you can leave in there. Other metadata, this would be anything like, uh, again, uh, uh, um, anything that you've actually, uh, uh, that we've added to this. Keywording would be a part of this. Uh, any of those kind of things in here. Um, also, in your copyright information, do not put your fucking physical address in there. Okay. Um, so that will get us through metadata right here. Finally, the last thing here, watermarking. If you do want to work, so everybody, I need everybody to get to watermarking because you can see some of them happen right in here. If you go from none down to text, you'll see that you can actually enter text in here. And so for me, if I did want to watermark this, I could put this copyrighted with my name. So the copyright symbol is option and the letter G. It'll actually, you'll see it's coming up right here. It's put in that copyright symbol, space, verser. Engelhard, 2019. And you can see in my case, it's too big. So I can change the scaling of this by simply clicking on the slider and scaling it down so it's completely across that. You can change where it falls, I'm going horizontally or vertically. So you can take it up or down in any of this. You can change its opacity so it goes from pure white to nothing. So this is how you would change all of that. You could also, instead of doing text, you can actually use an image. And in this image part right here, you would just say, okay, and it's gonna ask you to drop an image right here. Uh, I'm actually going to select an image. If you click on this, you can go after a file. And I think I have a Vogue file somewhere. Well, here, I'll just put in, um, what do I have that we can actually do that would be a good overlay? Oh, I know where it is. Columbia Commercial Session 5. Tear sheet. Holiday is going to be my watermark. Does this make sense? So you can do text or image, either one. In our case, I'm not going to watermark this file. I'm actually going to say none to this. Um, so we've gotten through all of this part. This part is now correct. Check your output location. Make sure that this is where you want it to go. It is for me. Check your output naming. Again, it's simply going to name this file. Now, in my case, it's only putting image name in here. That's not necessarily what, maybe that's what I want, maybe that's not what I want. If I want to change the output naming for some other reason, again, you would simply click on these little three dots, and this is the naming thing that we have been using all along. It's, you can go in here and build anything you want uh, uh, using, um, um, any of these uh, tokens in here. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it. It's just the image name. And then finally, process summary happens right down here. This one is an important one that you should actually have open when you're doing this part to uh, actually have uh, so that we can see the processes that are actually going to be done in here. And you can see that this is going to build 181 megabyte file size. And this is important to actually know because any time that there's a problem in here, this will actually come up here. It will show you the problem that we actually have. So I'm going to go back up here to our process rest recipe. This has actually now been uh, built and it's going to process this file exactly the way we built it. Does that make sense everyone? Okay, however, it's not the only one that you need to do if you want to process multiple files here. So for instance, you guys have got uh, one that's called JPEG Quick Proof. Do you have that? I want you to put a check mark next to JPEG Quick Proof. Um, do you also have one that's TIFF, 8-bit, Adobe RGB Max? Do you have that? Yeah. Put a check mark next to that guy as well. However, what you'll notice is that none of the recipe down here has actually changed. If we go back to basic, even though I've got a check mark next to JPEG Quick Proof right here, that's not what this is. To the, the thing that is reflected in the recipe is always the highlighted one. So you'll see, I've got a check mark here. It's highlighted. That's the recipe for this. 
If I select the JPEG Quick Proof, you'll notice all of this changes. This is how you would edit the JPEG Quick Proof. You would come in here and say, oh, I want to add a watermark to that guy, and this is how you would do that. Does this make sense? So the highlighted one is always the one you're editing. It's not necessarily the one you're going to print. If I uncheck this check, it's never going to print, it's never going to develop, it's never going to process this file. This is just allowing me to change this. The two files that it will process are this TIFF 18-bit and the TIFF 16-bit here because of the check marks. So the check marks are the processes that will be done. The highlight is the recipe that you are editing. And you don't have any limit to the number of these. You can put check marks next to everything and get versions of those files. Does this make sense to everyone? Liz. Does this have to be part of the professional practice, though, when you um, charge someone for like, the process? Yes. This is, kind of what you're about. this is exactly what I'm talking about. And this is when you play it up big, Liz. This is when you say to them, you want me to do a quick proof for you. You want me to do a JPEG high res for your website. And you also want me to do a Photoshop and a TIFF file of this. And then you want a DNG of that as well. It's going to take me all night. You go home, you pour a very large glass of wine. Do you drink wine? Uh, oh, I didn't know if you were a hard liquor drinker. You seem more that kind of girl to me. You're multi, me too. Anyway, pour yourself a very large of whatever you want to pour yourself. You just click eight check marks in here to process everything you want. You select a thousand files that they want that all for. You hit the process button. You turn on your favorite mindless TV show, Taylor Swift tomorrow night. Can't wait. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, and you go to bed, and you get up in the morning, and it's all tricked out for you, and it's beautiful. So really quickly before you guys do this, go ahead and put your check mark back on your quick proof part. And I want you to click on the, to, the quick proof to edit it. So make sure it's edited with a check mark next to it. I want you to come into File again really quick on this part right here. And you'll see that do you have a subfolder called JPEG Quick Proof? No? Type that in. Type in JPEG Quick Proof for that. And then finally, I want you to go up and click on your TIFF 8-bit version. And also tell me, do you have a TIFF 8-bit version in subfolder? If you don't, type that in. You want to go ahead and do these. And the, the beauty of this is that these recipes then stay forever for you. You don't have to do this but once. Well, as soon as you build this part, you'll be good to go on this. Finally, I am going to reset my output folder back to the folder that I actually had for uh, the original output folder here, just because it makes it a little bit cleaner. So I need to find out where I'm actually doing this session. So this session is in week 12 of this class. So that's where I'm going to put it. Um, so again, back in my navigation part here, I'm scrolling down to Verser, down to Columbia College, Columbia College, down to Assisting in Digital Tech class, down to Week 12, down to this session, and down to Output. Control click to put this as my output folder. <clears throat> and I don't need to save the old one. And then again, I'm going to go back to my process recipe right here just to make sure. I'm going to click on this little arrow to make sure it goes to that output folder. It does. And then I'm going to go back into my image here. Let me click so I can show my entire uh, capture folder. So I want to select all of these guys. I just want to, I'm going to grab all of these. Well, not all of them. Let's grab one, two, three, four. Let's grab the first five, six of these guys. So simply select the very top one, hold down the shift key and select the, the last one. I just want to show you that there's uh, some things that can change in here. Then again, I'm going to click on my process uh, uh, <clears throat> tab right here. So I do have a check mark next to TIFF 8-bit. I do have a check mark next to my quick proof. And I've got a check mark on the uh, uh, TIFF 8-bit uh, right here. I want you to uncheck all of those really quickly for me. This happens all the time. 
And you'll see I've got this 8-bit TIFF selected. However, if you look at your process summary right now, you will see that there is a big red flag right down here. And what this is telling you is, if you try to hit the word process, click on it, you'll get this warning and say there are no enabled recipes to process because even though you have that thing selected, there are no check marks in there. So go ahead and say OK to that and then go back up to your process recipes. Put a check mark in there, another check mark next to Quick Proof, and then another check mark in your Adobe 16 bit, and then click Process. Now, when you do that, it's going to actually give you a thing that starts to work your way over. You need to click on the last of the th uh, icons at the top, the multi gear one. This is your process recipe right here. This is the thing that's everything it's going through. It's processing all of these files right now. It's now starting to process the second one right here. You can stop the process right here. It just pauses the queue. The reason this is important to you is that a lot of times as a digital tech, you're going to be asked to process files while people are actually shooting. So what happens is, if your computer is actually processing these files while you're trying to shoot tethered, it dramatically slows your computer down and you are, you're, you're, it's almost as bad as shooting uh, tethered into Lightroom. So what you want to do for this in this carry case right here is that as long as somebody is shooting, they're actually doing tethered captures, they're coming in, pause your queue. But the minute they quit shooting, start your queue up again. Cues are not specific to, so for instance here, if you go back and you look at our uh, library right here, um, we don't have any session favorites in here, but if we did have session favorites in here, it doesn't matter. You can be shooting to a different session favorite. So I've got, let's say I've got shot one, two, three, four, five in my session favorites. I can start processing session, the, the shot number one. And then I can be shooting into session number two. That cue will not be lost. It stays no matter what. As long as it's within the session itself, you're good to go. Does that make sense? So then you can go back to this cue here. You can move stuff around in the cue. So all of a sudden, you've got an art director that says, I don't give a shit about the girl with the card. I need to see, I need the files for the girl uh, for the headshot right away. You can click on this and simply move the girl down, the girl that's in the top part down here. You used to be able to move them down. Yep, you can move her down so that now when we start the queue back up again, the headshots are going to be the first one to process. So then go ahead and click on Start Queue again. And I want to go ahead and finish the headshot ones processing. And then I can stop the queue again. You can eliminate stuff that is in your queue. So you can see I've got, uh, uh, I'm going to grab the bottom one down here, simply hit the delete key. I can hit another one, the delete key again. I can hit the top one and delete that guy. And then I can click on this one and say I want to start processing again. So that's what goes on here in your queue. Does that make sense? If you click on history, this is the history of everything that you've actually done so far in this. And as you continue to go through in this session, this will point out everything that you've ultimately done. Is this all making sense? Finally, go back to your process recipe part. And just the easiest way to get to your output folder is to simply click on that output location and click on the little pointy arrow and it will kick you all the way over here and you will actually see inside your output you have three folders and each one of these folders is containing the files that you just processed in those process recipes. So these are all 8-bit Adobe RGB TIFFs. These are all 16-bit Adobe RGB TIFFs, and these are all very small JPEGs of all that same thing, and it's all of the same files. Does that make sense? And it's all sorted and ordered for you. Why they don't make that a default process, I'll never know. They should just um, automatically, when you type that in, it should just get typed in the name of your recipe. It should just get typed in your subfolder name. Are there questions about any of this? Okay, a couple of other things we've got to get through here, guys. Are we good here so far? Okay, um, let's go back into this. Here, I want to actually, and you'll be asked to do this a lot. 
Um, it's a great way to actually view a group of images. So I'm going to do a non-consecutive series of images. So I'm going to select the very top one. And instead of holding down the shift key, I'm going to hold down the command key and I'm going to click the one of the girl of the headshot. You'll notice that I just skipped that one file that's got the girl holding the color card in it. I'm going to zoom down here. I'm also going to skip the color card of this girl. However, I'm holding the command key again to select the girl on the bottom, uh, the girl under it, and then the other version under that. So I've got these four images selected. Was everybody able to do that? Discontinuous selections. Then I want you to come up to the file menu and come down to export web contact sheet and let go. When you do that, it will actually come up onto a screen right here. There's four possible website options that you can pick. Then Photoshop, I mean Capture One will generate all of the code, all of the content to actually run this. So um, the first thing that's going to come up is the theme of this. So if you click on theme, this drop down menu here up at the very top. Did you guys start with classic dark? All right, I'm going to go up and we'll start with classic dark. So what classic dark is, is it's a series of thumbnails that are actually named right here. If you actually click on one of these thumbnails, it will pop open. Uh, uh, it, it'll, it'll come up. Well, we'll do both kinds of this. If you click on that drop down menu and come down to classic light, it's the exact same thing, except it puts it on a gray background. If you come down to full screen dark, what it does is it gives you a full screen up at the top with thumbnails that run along the bottom and then full screen light, which will do the same thing except on a lighter image. For me, I typically do full screen dark. And again, the major thing about this, what you're trying to do here, the thing, the best thing about this is this is a way for you to build a website really quickly to show to a client so that a client can look at it online from someplace else. So you would build this website <clears throat> and then simply upload it to your own server, to your own, your, whatever's hosted on your own website. Um, this would just be a way that you can actually, uh, and then give them the, uh, the address, the website link to it, and they can come in and look at this. But this is also a way to do this locally. You can actually give this to them on a thumb drive or a hard drive, and then they can just view your images in a web browser instead of having to have Capture One and go through it that way. Does that sort of make sense? It's also just your final edit, so they're not looking at all your rejects and everything else. So let's title this thing. I'm going <clears> to <throat> call this uh, test website. And you can put a description in here. You can put copyright in here. Uh, this got copyrighted because it's sticky here. Uh, so I'm going to actually change my copyright to me. You can do this for you. Uh, web link in here. Again, I would put in my web link here as www.verser.net. Uh, the images here, again, this is controlling what it is you do want in this website and what it is you don't want in this website. So you can see in the drop down menu here, do you want anything underneath this? Do you want the file name? Do you want the variant name here? What do you want to actually be named here on the bottom? Uh, how big do you want your thumbnails? You can actually see this will control it to make it bigger or smaller. Here, the preview size, you control all of that, the quality of all of this, blah, 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 blah. Down here at the bottom part, you can actually say where you want this website put. I'm going to put mine, I'm going to change mine from my desktop to my toss folder. So just simply clicking on it, go to Verser, go to toss folder. That's where it's going to actually put the website inside of that. Uh, and then show after export. All that means is that it's going to open your website up in a browser. And then come over here to this part over here and simply click export. And it blows through all of that. And then you can now see that you've actually got a website. I am in Chrome right now. If you hover over the side of your image over to the left and right side, you'll see you get um, uh, arrows that will actually step you through the image like this. You can go back in the other direction like that. You can actually click on a thumbnail and it'll go straight to it. Pretty impressive. So Liz, how long will it take you to build a website of all the files you're going to process for me, for me tonight? Uh, 12, hours. 12 hours probably. So 2,500 bucks, will you do it for that? Okay, that sounds good. I'm serious. 
uh, say to somebody, okay, you want me to build a website of your first picks so that we can actually send that to a client? Yeah, yeah. I'll be happy to do it. It means I'm going to be up all night, but I'll be happy to do it. $2,000, okay. Uh, okay, back in Capture One. We're almost through it, guys. Thanks for hanging in here. And just make sure that we're getting through all the part that I want to get through. Yep. Uh, okay, a couple other things I want to talk to you about really quickly. And it's going to be back in recipes. I want to show you how to build a CMYK conversion recipe. <clears throat> uh, we'll do that one as well. So simply come into, again, the single gear. We're going to do a brand new recipe. So click on the little drop down menu here uh, to do a brand new recipe. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this um, uh, TIFF. No, we'll, do, we'll start uh, swap. Yeah, S W O P coded, uh, swap coded is a CMYK uh, 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 color space, a CMYK uh, TIFF 8-bit. And we're going to build that recipe. So again, with this whole thing highlighted, with this thing highlighted, Come down to process recipe, open this up. In this file, in the part, go back to basic. In your drop down menu, this is going to be a TIFF file. It is going to be 8 bit. It is not going to be compressed. However, in this drop down menu for ICC profile, you need to come down to show all and then go right back to it again. And we need to go find that swap coded 8 bit. Now, you guys should have it, it should be in your computer. It, uh, because it's usually loaded as part of your system, um, but in, it's probably going to be pretty far down towards the bottom of whatever list you've got. You'll see I've got a gazillion printer profiles in here, but I'm coming down to the very bottom of this, and you can see in the very bottom, this is where all the CMYK outputs are. Do you guys have this? Yes? Okay, it's all the way down at the bottom, CMYK output. What we're looking for right down here is US web coded swap. That's the one that we just said that we wanted to make. And so I'm going to let go of that. And you'll see it's put it right in here. You'll also notice how all of our images got really pale because, again, all of their previews here are being, uh, they're being previewed as to what these would look like on a swap coded uh, CMYK press. Um, then again, down here, I'm not going to open with anything. I'm going to leave the scale fixed. I'm going to go to file here. And in file, I'm going to create a subfolder. And in the subfolder, I'm going to call this swap coded CMYK TIFF 8 bit. Oops. Uh, and then again, I know it's going to my output location. Now I'm going to uncheck all of the other recipes. I'm going to uncheck that Adobe RGB 16-bit. I don't want to. Pro I don't want to do that one again on these files. I'm going to uncheck the uh, 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 the Quick Proof. I'm going to uncheck the TIFF. The only one that I've got checked is this swap coded guy. I'm going to go down to my process summary at the bottom. I'm going to click on process. And it's going to say the queue has been stopped. Do you want to start again? And I'm going to say no, because I want to check to see what is in the queue. And I've got these two are being queued up. That's the only thing that's actually going on here. So I'm fine. So I'm going to click process again and say, yep, go ahead and start it up again. You can see that my readouts up here now are no longer giving me RGB. Look at my color readouts here. These are now in CMYK up here at the top. So I'm hovering over this girl's face and I'm getting the CMYK readout. So this is how you get CMYK readout values inside of Capture One is to simply uh, 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 make sure that the recipe that you are using uh, or that is highlighted to be uh, used is um, um, or to be edited is actually the uh, one, the process recipe. Um, so it's going through here. You can see it's doing the conversions on all of these guys. There's a countdown. It's telling me there's going to be 33 or 30 seconds left. I'll go take a look at the queue to see what's going through here. You can see it's processing 
Uh, all of these guys right here, <clears throat> it's going through it. We'll see what happens again. I'll go back to the process summary and see we're almost there. And <clears throat> done. Go back into your folder, and you will notice now that inside your output folder, you have got a swap folder that's in there, swap coded CMYK 8-bit TIFF RGB. If you click on one of these guys to open or just drag it onto Photoshop, You will see that it opens up in Photoshop, and you can also see right down here that it is a US web coded swap file. It is also a 8-bit file. You can see that part right there. And then it is also a TIFF file because it's got that TIFF extension on it. So this was exactly what we would expect. Are there questions about this? All right. I want you to close that guy up really quickly. I want to go back into Capture One. I'm going to go back in my process recipe so that I'm not looking at these previews in swap, but I'm actually looking at them in Adobe RGB. So I'm simply going to click on the top one, Adobe RGB. I'm going to then unclick out of this. And I'm going to drag that last file. I mean, it's this one. Well, yeah, it's this one. It's the first of the variants of this girl, the one that we did the split toning on. Do you guys have that guy? I want you to drag that into Photoshop because I think that was number four, right? Oh, shit, I can't. Oh. Okay, can I color balance this image? Yep. So I'm just going to white balance using her pants. Look how dark this image looks. This is a case, this is a P30 um, uh, face back that is not well supported by Camera Raw. Again, there's no law that says Camera Raw has to uh, 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 support this kind of stuff. My own private experience will tell me that uh, it needs a full stop of additional exposure. So if you simply crank that up to a plus one, this will actually look the way it's supposed to look. Uh, and then you can either open this as an object. Uh, don't open it as an object. Go ahead and open it as an image. Um, if it says open image, you're good to go. If it says open object, simply hold down your shift key and you can open this as an image. I want to show you how you would actually convert this to a CMYK image in Photoshop. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that this part becomes critical to us. If you want control, if you as a digital tech are responsible for processing uh, uh, files into CMYK for a printer, which can certainly come up, you need the information, you need the following information from them. You need to know what color space that needs to be in. And there's a lot of them. So to see what that means, if you come up to your edit menu and come down to color settings, in this color management policy, well, first, right off the bat, what do you guys have up here in your settings? What's set on these computers? Say what? Oh, so it's North American Prepress 2? It's not general? Yeah, so what's wrong with general purpose? Look at what your working space is. What is your RGB work? I mean, sorry, what is your, uh, yeah, your RGB working space? It's sRGB, isn't it? Yeah. Do you want your files to be in sRGB? No. Even worse, look down here. All the color mismanagement policies, have these all been unchecked? Yep, they're all turned off. This is how Adobe ships. It's the worst thing in the world. This is how you fuck up your files, and you don't know you fucked them up because you, you didn't get any warning. So you want to change that drop-down menu from North American General Purpose 2 to North American Prepress 2, and then these will be set correctly. However, what I wanted to show you is this drop-down menu right here for uh, CMYK. If you click on this drop-down, it will show you a whole range of possible CMYK files, uh, 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 spaces that you can actually develop your uh, file into. You have got to get this information from the printer or from the photographer, or whoever it is you're doing, because if you actually convert this to a web-coded swap version 2, but it's really being printed on a Japan Color 2001 coded, your work is going to look like shit, and you are going to be blamed. 
So in most cases, most digital texts that I know refuse to do CMY correction or uh, 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 conversion because the liability is simply too great. Does this make sense? In our case, we're going to go ahead and be brave, and we're going to stick with this web-coded swap version 2. Uh, so you can say OK to that. So then to actually do the conversion, come up to the uh, uh, image menu, down to mode, and down to CMYK. And you'll see that this warning comes up, and it'll tell you that you're about to use this. You're going to convert it to this web-coded swap version 2. If you want to choose a different one, you need to go back to where we were before and choose a different profile. But in our case, we're going to say OK to that, and it will then do the conversion for us. And if you want to see the before and after, simply hit the Command Z, and you'll see, especially in the green background, you lose all sorts of saturation. Uh, it's just out of gamut. Uh, uh, again, a printer can't print that saturated of a color. Are there questions about this? Are we good on this part? All right. You can close that guy up. You don't need to save that. I need to show you guys one. Oh, wait. I don't need to show you this. I'll show it to you later. Um, I need everybody to please do a course evaluation of this class, like now. So I don't, you guys know how to get there, right? I don't even know where you go. Oasis, I think. So I'm going to do that first, because I've got to get that done. And then as soon as you're finished with that, there's one last thing I want to show you. Um, and we should have time to do that part. I take it back. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let me show you this last thing first, and then just if you guys could do the course evaluation. Is that OK? All right. So this last thing is, how do you do a legitimate copy and a legitimate backup? And um, there is a program that everyone in the industry uses. It's got nothing to do with Capture One. Um, it's this program right here called Chronosync. So Liz just bought, Liz, did you buy Chronosync? Did, and what version did you buy? Just like the regular one? Yeah. And could you mind telling me how much it was? 50 bucks. 50 bucks. So guys, it's a $50 investment. Um, that $50 is a, is a lifetime license. You'll never have to buy it again. They update this shit all the time. It's an amazing program. But I'm going to show you why you want to be considering it and why not. So I'm going to say right now, let's say, for instance, that I want to, I just need a folder as, as, to sort of give you some idea of what's going on. Um, I need to back up my output folder here. No, actually, I'm going to back up the entire session. I need to back up this session right here. That's what I need to back up, right? And so um, I've got one window that's open here. I'm going to open up another window right here. We've talked about this, I think, before in this class, that you always want to copy in one direction when you're working with the finder. So in my finder situation here, I want to copy between these two guys right here. I've got a hard drive that's connected to my uh, folder right here. And what I want to do is I want to copy this to here. And so you simply drag and drop. And it goes pretty quick. And you're done, right? The problem with that is that how do you know that file didn't just get corrupted? How do you know everything in here has not been corrupted? Well, the only way to really know is that you've got to go in here to the copy that you just made. I'm going to go into here. Yep, that was the one I did. And I've got to launch this into Capture One. I've then got to go into my output folder, and I've got to go in, and I've got to open up every single one of these files in Photoshop to know that I've truly got a backup. That's what you have to do. There's no other way to know that, is there? Well, the truth of it is, there is a way to know that. So I'm going to get rid of everything that's in here. I'm just going to keep the folder on my hard drive. So I'm going to get rid of everything that's in here. We're going to do this in Chronosync instead. And I'm going to show you how to do this really quickly. Uh, first off, I'm going to copy this name so I don't have to re-enter it again. And then inside of Chronosync, this is how you do it. 
Once ChronoSync opens, it will remember all the synchronizations that you've done in the past. That's all the, these things are. It'll let you, because a lot of people do the same syncing over and over and over again. You always sync from one of your hard drives to another hard drive or from your laptop hard drive to an external hard drive. You build what they call a synchronized document to do this with, and then you simply have to click on it. You don't have to go set it up every single time. So in our case, though, we need to do a new one. So I'm going to do this to build a new synchronizer. A screen's going to open up, and it's going to ask me for the name. And again, I'm going to paste in that name, because this is the name that I'm uh, actually going to. So I'm going to say OK to that. And then you need to choose what you want synced. So I'm going to come over here and click on this folder. And I'm going to navigate to where the original folder is. So it's in Columbia College. It's in the Assistant Digital Tech class in week number 12 and it's sitting right here. It's, this is the folder that I'm actually want to back up. Make sense? I'm going to say OK to that to select that. And then on the other side, I'm going to pick the empty folder that has that same name on my hard drive. And it's right here. And say OK. And so now what's going to happen is all the information that's in here is going to be moved to this folder over here. However, the last thing, and this is why everybody pays the 50 bucks, is this. You come down to Options, you click on Options, and instead of doing your basic file handling, you click on this drop-down menu and you do Basic with Verification. And what basic with verification does is it looks, it does the copy just like it will do it in the finder, but then it goes in and it makes certain that everything that existed in the original set is moved to the, so it makes, that, makes certain that those two things are identical. And it does it using a really sophisticated algorithm. And if it doesn't, if they're not the same, you get this warning <clears throat> that comes up and says, that didn't work. You need to do this again. You need to go back and find out again. So if it does work and you're good to go, you don't have to open all this stuff up again. So then I'm going to go back to my setup. I'm going to hit synchronize. It's going to go through. It'll take just about the very same time that it took to do it before. You can see there's a little countdown. And when you see this and you hear that little ding, you know you're good to go and you don't have to worry about opening all that shit up. Are there questions about this? Okay, guys, um, if I can get you to do those evaluations, that's the last that I have for today to show you. Um, have a great Thanksgiving. Say what? Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you.